Dank u, François. Goedemiddag. En groeten van de gereformeerde kerk in Canada. Maar ik ga verder in Engels. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to be here this evening. I was asked to speak on a topic: Does scientific evidence contradict the Bible? Uh, many people think so today, even uh, Reformed theologians. So here's a, a famous Reformed theologian, Bruce Waltke, who wrote a few years ago, he says, if the data is overwhelming in favor of evolution, to deny that reality will make us a cult, some odd group that is not really interacting with the world. To deny scientific reality would be to deny the truth of God in the world. For us as Christians, this would serve as our spiritual death, because we would not be loving God with all of our minds. It would also be our spiritual death and witness to the world because we would not be seen as credible. So he's saying that uh, we have to accept evolution because God is telling us that through science. And if we don't, we won't be able to witness the gospel. Now, of course, if you do that, there are certain implications. Uh, a few years uh, after that, so almost the same time, there were a few professors from Calvin College which was a reformed university in America. And they said, well, if the theology department is telling us that evolution occurred, then we in the theology department have to accept that as reality. And then we have to look at what the implications are. Well, the first implication is biblical authority. Because if Adam never existed, if he's just a literary figure, then Paul was mistaken, because Paul in the New Testament refers to Adam. And Jesus takes the Old Testament literally as well, so that means that they were mistaken, which means that we can't trust the Bible and everything it says. The second problem is that of original sin. If man was never upright to start with, as the traditional view of Genesis says, then sinfulness is something that comes from evolution. But evolution has to do with survival of the fittest which means that you have to be selfish to survive, uh, which means that your character is formed by evolution, and if God is created through evolution, that means that God has made us sinful to start with. So man's sinful condition is not something that he brought on himself, as we believe in our Reformed Confessions. <coughs> So if you compare that to Belgian Confession Article 14 and 15, and there it stresses that we're sinful because Adam was sinful and he passed his fallen nature onto us. But we have to do away with that now if we believe in evolution. Not only that, but evolution is something that depends on death. Because as the man evolves from animals, so that means he has to keep getting better, keep Proving, which means that death is not something that's caused by human sin, as uh, the Bell's Confession teaches us, Article 17, but death is something that drives evolution. So self death is something that's God, that's part of God's very good creation that he made in Genesis 1. Not only that, but if death is not punishment for sin, then why did Jesus have to die? So they argue that Christ's death does not atone for our sins, but Christ's death is just a moral example for us to follow. So Christ doesn't save you. If you're still in your sins. On the other hand, they conclude that because God made us sinful to start with, then our sinful nature is God's problem, and therefore if God is merciful, he will save everyone. Now that's a comforting thought, because that means it doesn't matter what you do or what you believe, you're all going to be saved. The, the trouble is, it's not a biblical thought, because in the Bible, we just heard it tonight in the sermon, Jesus Christ is going to come back, and then he'll judge the living and the dead, and there'll be two camps, those whose names are written in the books of life, and those who are unbelievers who've rejected God. So you can see that evolution is not something that's academic, that has to do with the past, but it's something that has to do with the very foundation of the gospel. That once you buy into evolution, 
there are certain drastic compliments that are going to affect your salvation. A study has been made uh, of Christian colleges. Most colleges in uh, Europe and in North America started off as Christian colleges, but they became secularized. Uh, the main problem, according to William Ringerberg, why did Christian colleges become secular? It's the whole factors involved. None affected more sweeping change than the graduate acceptance of Darwinian biology. And Colin Brown says the same thing. By far the most important single factor to undermine popular belief in the existence of God in modern times is the evolutionary theory of Charles Darwin. Now, some theologians have gone even further. Uh, Rudolf Boltzmann is a famous New Testament theologian. He argues that um, if you use medicine, if you use uh, smartphones and computers, if you use modern science, uh, that is inconsistent to also believe in miracles and angels and things of that nature. Because he believed that science comes as a package. And if you use science, then you're really believing in it, and then you can no longer believe in the Testament. So he never believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ that actually occurred. To him, it was just an example of uh, a parable, if you like, of the mastery of our human passions. Now, this is far going, but he claimed that this is based on scientific evidence. We have a number of uh, atheist writers saying the same thing as Biltzman, uh, Richard Dawkins, you may have heard of him. He has written, one person suffers from a delusion, it is called insanity, When many people come, suffer from an illusion, it's called religion. He also wrote to Darwin, made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. And that's because before Darwin, People couldn't explain how they got here. And now with Darwin, they explain that everything came about through evolution and that we don't need God anymore to explain origins. So he has written also that faith is belief in spite of the lack of evidence. So again, his argument is that all the evidence is for science, none of the evidence is for Christianity. Uh, Stephen Hawking, many of you as well, famous physicist, says the same thing. He says we can explain everything with physics, so we don't need God to create the world. The ignorance of nature's ways led people in ancient times to invent gods, but nowadays we don't need to do it anymore. We know better, so we can do without God. And one last one here, another physicist has written a book called The New Atheism, taking a stand for science and reason. Faith is always foolish, at least to many evils. Faith is belief in the absence of supporting evidence. So he claims that to be rational, a belief should be supported by evidence. A belief in God is not supported by sufficient evidence, and therefore it is irrational. So that's the question I want to investigate tonight. Uh, how rational is science? Uh, how strong is the evidence against Christianity? But the myth that you hear is that science is factual, and it's objective, it's rational, whereas on the other side, religion is mythical, subjective, and irrational. And if you base creation evolution in these terms, then creation will always lose, and evolution will always win. But if you look at science more deeply, you find the reality is that science has an objective aspect, but also a subjective aspect. In science, we have to distinguish on the one hand between what you can actually see in the laboratory or through a telescope, and on the other hand, the scientific theories that are invented to explain the data. So the data is very objective, but we'll find that the theory has a very large creative element in it. For example, if you look at through a telescope at galaxies, uh, here's a picture from the Hubble telescope. Uh, there's hundreds of galaxies in that picture. If you study galaxies, you find that the light from galaxies is shifted towards the red. The further away a galaxy is, the more it's shifted to the red. And the question is, uh, what causes the red shift? Now, one theory is that uh, space is expanding. This is Big Bang cosmology. It's the most common theory. But there are other theories. For example, uh, maybe space is standing still, but galaxies are moving through space. 
Or maybe there's a large end at the other end of the universe, which is causing what's called a gravitational redshift. So it's not caused by motion, but it's caused by a gravitational force. Or maybe the speed of light was really fast in the past, and that's getting less. Or maybe instead of the universe being bigger, atoms are getting smaller. Shrinking, you're shrinking, everything is shrinking, you also get a red effect. Or maybe as light travels, it just gets tired. Like tired red light has less energy, so the further it travels, the more tired it gets. And you have this theory here. Now I've got six theories, there are more. All of these you'll find in the literature. And the question is, which one of these theories is correct? Now if you have a vote among scientists, the vote for the first one. But just because uh, most people believe a particular belief uh, doesn't make it correct. So that's the problem that we have. Uh, you have theories, different theories that can explain the same data. So how then do you choose which of those theories is the right one? So obviously that depends upon your world view, how you look at reality. There's a philosopher of science called Hempel who says the transition from data to theory requires creative imagination. Scientific theories are not derived from observed facts, but are invented in order to account for them. So to be a scientist, uh, it's not just uh, logic and reason. There is inventive and creative elements there, just like in this painting here. Uh, there's an order there, but there's also some creativity. For example, in an old textbook, you'll find this picture of ancient man. What is the evidence behind this picture? Well, it turns out that the evidence uh, for everything in this picture is uh, one tooth. So here's four different views of that one tooth. So all the rest of this is just the imagination of the artist. And it turns out that that tooth turned out the tooth of a pig. Tiger picture here is just great imagination. If I could find this in the scientific textbook, or I can dig the way back. Uh, nowadays, uh, you may have heard of Lucy. Uh, a skeleton they found in Ethiopia a few years back. Uh, is it an ape or is it a human? Well, it depends. Here's one picture of it. It uh, looks sort of half human, but if you look at the evidence on which it's based, uh, the white part of that skull is just plaster. The actual bones they found are the dark parts. So you can see again the face uh, is largely the uh, artist's imagination as to what this looked like. And depending as to whether you think it's going to it should be an ape or a man, you're going to draw your picture accordingly. So another philosopher of science has said scientific theories are not only equally improvable and equally improbable, but also equally undisputable. So the first he says you can never uh, prove a theory because how do you know that's moral? Somebody's not going to come along with data that's going to disprove it. Second, he says they're equally improbable because if you have a number of data points, there's an infinite number of lines or theories that you can fit through that. So the chance of any particular theory being correct is one out of infinity, which is zero. Then he says they're also equally unprovable because if you really like a particular theory, then you can always save that theory by making additional theories that will protect that theory. For example, if you believe the Earth is flat, then you could make a theory that would be impossible to disprove. You may think you could disprove it by looking at the Earth from outer, from outer space, so it might travel in straight lines, whereas now for my theory, it might travel in curved lines. So you, you could protect your, any theory you like by making adjustments to other theories. So for example, say Big Bang cosmology, deflation was invented, so I'm not going to explain that, but it's a very theoretical speculative concept. That made certain predictions which didn't turn out, so then they invented dark matter. Uh, that led to many problems, they invented dark energy, the same Big Bang cosmology. And no matter what deficiencies you find, you can always invent new concepts to explain your favorite theory. So which theories would you choose? 
pure scientist. Well, you'll choose that theory that fits in best with your worldview. Now, worldview is a very basic concept that has to do with the very basic questions of life. Does God exist? Uh, why are we here? But what is man? What can we know? What should we do? What can we hope for? These are all the very deep philosophical questions, but also questions that you should all be asking as to your purpose in life. And how you answer those questions uh, depends upon what you're going to consider as scientific evidence and what you're going to reject as scientific evidence. So the main conflict nowadays is between naturalism on one hand and Christianity on the other hand. So naturalism, let me give you quotes from William Provine, he's a naturalist. So these are atheists. And he's written that evolutionary biology tells us there's no purpose in nature, no God. So everything that happens, including yourself, is just to be accidents. Second, there are no inherent moral laws. Okay, there's no right and wrong. The third, human beings are marvelously complex uh, machines. The fourth, when you die, we die, that's the end of it. There's no hope of everlasting life. And free will does not exist. Evolution can't produce a being that's fully free to make choices. So you may think that you make choices, or you have thoughts, but those are just the illusions, as we see. And the universe cares nothing for us. There's no ultimate meaning for humans. If you think about this, it's, uh, it's a pretty bleak uh, code to live by. But that's the majority view that you find in the science departments in uh, most universities today. Uh, Chesterton has written, an uh, extraordinary view has written that disbelievers in miracles consider them cold and fairy, while believers in miracles accept them only in connection with some dogma. But then he writes, uh, the opposite is true, the fact is the other way, the believers in miracles accept them because they have evidence for them, the disbelievers in miracles deny them because they have a doctrine. Yes. So scientists may say that it's irrational to believe in miracles, uh, but how can we prove that miracles are impossible, that miracles haven't occurred? So there's lots of accounts of miracles you'll find them in the Bible, uh, lots of people claim to have had miraculous experiences. So the evidence seems to be that there are miracles, but because it doesn't fit into materialism, uh, it's rejected. Uh, I said that the uh, data is fairly objective, the theories are subjective, but even the data you can question. A few years ago we had what's called the climate gate, and that stressed, it turned out that a lot of studies in uh, global warming, I think we got the data was, um, was fudged, things were changed, uh, papers that uh, argued against global warming weren't accepted for publication, so there's a lot of bias there. That's why here you have a man, a scientist looking through a telescope, but there's a politician there holding up to what he's supposed to be seeing. Uh, one author uh, did a study of uh, scientific papers, and he found that a randomly chosen scientific paper has less than 50% chance of being true. Yeah, they do studies, uh, but bias, uh, poor study design, uh, there's lots of pressure to publish papers. Uh, if you're in academia, so there's a lot of fraudulent papers, they just make up the data. So data may get distorted, he writes, suppressed and fabricated. The paper's critical of the reigning paradigm. If it's a mainstream science, then you refuse rejection. Interesting case, uh, a few years ago, 20 years ago now, actually, uh, this uh, graph was published uh, as evidence for global warming. The temperature is uh, vertical, the timeline is horizontal, and it looks pretty convincing that it's global warming. But a couple of months later, another paper was published, and it showed some of the data before and after the data that was published. Uh, you can see that if you include that data, you get a different point of view. So the data in the first paper was true. It's accepted that left out the stuff that didn't fit in, or the second paper uh, different. In all kinds of cases of fraud, particularly having to do with human origins, because each country wants to be the one uh, which has the oldest human 
specimens. So I just have a couple of cases here of, of fraud where it turns out that there's a score of scientific papers that have to be retracted uh, because of fraudulent uh, design. Now, Goldman says that if you believe, if you use computers and smartphones, you should also believe in evolution because it comes as a package deal. But there is quite a difference between evolution and the technology that goes behind computers. We have to distinguish between what we call operation science. That's the science that's actually done in labs. So it's basic science. If someone does an experiment and reports it, you can try to repeat it and see if you get the same results. So that's most of science, physics, chemistry, biology, all of the science needed for technology. And on the other hand, we have what we call historical science. So here we deal with extrapolation from the distant past. So geology, astronomy, uh, evolutionary biology would all be part of historical science. Here you have to distinguish quite strongly between the data that you collect and the interpretation that you put on the data. Because you can interpret the data through a naturalist worldview or a Christian worldview. And the discussion between uh, creation and evolution uh, is not the discussion uh, of science versus faith, if you like, or science versus Christianity, but it's two ways of looking at science. It's a naturalist view of science versus a Christian view of science. So in historical science, worldview plays a large role. Now in science, uh, observations are very important. So reliable data always trumps scientific theories. If the scientific theory is against the data, it should be rejected. So if you look at the past, historical science, it should conform to reliable historical records. For example, there was a lava flow in Hawaii that was dated by radiometric methods to be about 22 million years old, but it was known to have occurred in the year 1881. So in this case, we certainly reject the date of 22 million years because we've observed that uh, that was false. So similarly, if the Bible contains reliable historical information, thank you, uh, which uh, as Christians we believe it does, then we should insist that biblical data should constrain scientific explanations of the past. So the Bible is God's word, and if God knows everything, then surely uh, what's written in the Bible about Adam and Eve and Noah's flood and all of those things, so we should accept that. And if scientific theory is going to explain reality, it should explain the data, including the biblical data. I note also that the biblical faith uh, is based on evidence. So Romans 1 tells us that God's invisible qualities are clear from nature, so men are without use. The evidence of God is clear in there. Just look around you, look at the beauty of nature, the grandeur. Uh, Paul backs up Christ's resurrection with eyewitness reports. The Bible presents itself with evidence. Uh, John writes, these things are written that we might believe. So there's a good case for arguing that the Bible itself is evidence and that scientific theories, if they're going to use the evidence, they should also use the biblical evidence. Also, in the textbook is presented as if evolution explains everything. That's the claim that was made by Hawkins as well, that physics explains everything, that we don't need God. But if you actually investigate how much science explains, or mainstream science, then you'll find there's huge holes. Uh, Big Bang cosmology, I discussed that already, that every time they have a problem there, they try to fix it up by bringing in new things. Uh, nobody knows how galaxies are formed. Uh, there's no theory for the origin of life. Uh, there's no observed macroevolution. And uh, scientists done experiments on E. coli, bacteria. He's gone for 60,000 generations. And he observes some small changes, but uh, they never end up becoming dogs or cats or anything like that. You keep going and having the same bacteria. So the problem is, how do you ever get from simple life to more complicated life? You need to have influx of information. 
Uh, most mutations that occur are bad. They will kill the organism. Whereas evolution is supposed to be driven by good mutations, which occur every once in a while. Also, how do you ever get to mind? You start with matter. You can never get to mind, to consciousness, because that's something that's totally different. So the evolutionists have no theory for mind, and they have to claim that mind is an illusion. And here's a picture of the simplest cell. And if you look at it, it's, uh, it's a huge factory. Every part has to play its bits. And you ask yourself, how could something like this ever arise by chance? Because for evolution to occur, this has to reproduce itself. So everything has to work for that to happen. And if one part is missing, the whole thing collapses. Uh, if you look at fossil evidence, I have an evolutionist quote here, Ernst Meyer, but he says that the fossils either look like apes or they look like humans. You haven't got such gradual progression between the two. And therefore, he says that we have to fall back on the time honored method of historical science, which is the construction of an historical narrative. So, what that means is that we can't explain it, so we create a story to explain uh, how we evolved. The argument is we know that evolution happens, because we're here. It couldn't happen any other way, but we're not sure of the details yet. But so there's a lot of details that are missing. Also, Stephen Hawking, uh, although he says you don't need God, he comes to the conclusion that you don't have any free will, that your mind is an illusion, because if you start with matter, you can't get to mind. And so it seems that uh, we're just biological machines, that free will is just an illusion. Sir Francis Crick, discovered the DNA, he says the same thing. He says, the, uh, all of your thoughts, your minds, the use of these illusions caused by your brain neurons, and you don't really have any thoughts or control over what you do. Also, there's no morals. There's no moral basis. So morality is just something that evolution put in place to help us get along together so that we can evolve. There's no absolute right or wrong. The philosopher Derek Parable has written, given our best scientific theories, factors beyond their control, produce all our actions, and we're therefore not morally responsible for them. But then he says, so for criminals, we shouldn't give them severe punishments because they can't help what they do. They have no control over their minds. The funny thing with this is that if criminals have no controls over what they do, how can judges have control? <laughs> or philosophers. So just by writing this, he's trying to get you to change your mind on it, but that contradicts his <coughs> you don't have any control over your mind. Why are we here? According to the way I provide, there's no ultimate meaning for humans. We have no purpose whatsoever. Dawkins writes, we are a machine built by DNA whose purpose is to make more copies of the same DNA as every living object to solve the reason for living. Now, this is the same guy that said before uh, that Darwin made it possible to be intellectually fulfilled atheist. <laughs> but if you're intellectually how can you be intellectually fulfilled if you have no mind? And if his only purpose of living is to produce more copies of himself, then why is he wasting time writing books and lecturing? He should be alone with his wife. <laughs> so you find that ultimately that naturalism is self-destruct. If you try to defend it, you have to use all kinds of concepts which make sense from a Christian worldview, but don't from a naturalist worldview. Now, one argument that Christians make is that many theistic evolutionists are trying to combine Christianity and naturalism. One argument is that God has revealed himself in two books. Bible, but also through nature. And since all truth is God's truth, that means we should interpret the Bible in line with nature, which we then equate with uh, science, which we equate with evolution. That was the quote in 80 right at the beginning from Bruce Waltke. Uh, the end result is, with the true book theory, that we have to reinterpret the Bible in line with the evolutionary theory. Now, the Belgian Confession does talk about the two books. That we know God first by creation, preservation, and government. But all that they really reveal is just God's power and deity. They don't reveal anything about the past as such. 
And secondly, the Delta Confession says that God reveals to make himself more clearly and fully known to us by his holy divine word as far as is necessary. So it says here that yes, God does reveal truth through nature. The Bible is the more full and clearer revelation, and you know, we have to interpret what we see in nature through the spectacles of the Bible rather than the other way around. So the book of nature, general revelation, it reveals God's power. God's written word is clearer. If nature is a book, then it's a picture book. You just look around you at nature, it doesn't tell you things in words, it doesn't give you thoughts, but just a series of pictures. But the message of the book of nature is obvious. It says no one is without excuse. So you don't have to be a scientist to see the message of nature. It will strike everyone. And if it's a book of nature, remember that we're just looking at uh, AD 2017. We're looking at the pictures of this year. You can't go back, you can't flip back pages of the Book of Nature to see what happened uh, 2000 BC or 4000 BC or whatever. You're just looking at the picture book that you see it now. Also, don't confuse what you see in nature with scientific explanations of that. There's quite a difference between nature and science. And the Bible stresses the limits of human reasoning on origins. Uh, where were you, God asked you, but uh, when I'm here, so were you to criticize me or to question me? So here I just have that quote from Romans that you look around, you see the beauty of nature, and you're struck by the grandeur and the wisdom of God. A common argument for evolution uh, is that an ancient earth evolution uh, is so clear, the evidence so clear that it must be true, otherwise God is deceiving us. Now, this is an old argument. You find even a philosopher, Descartes, wrote the same thing. He says, God is perfect, hence God cannot perceive. So God not permit me to be deceived, to frame the truth for those propositions that seem entirely clear to me, and hence uh, my philosophy must be true. Descartes caused a lot of problems in the Reformed Church back around 1650 because his followers were the rationalists and they didn't believe in miracles. They reinterpreted it through the eyes of Descartes. But Descartes uh, claimed that uh, God had revealed that to him because it was so clear. So we have to be careful because you two are deceived by your own faulty assumptions. And if it's true that God does not receive, uh, then why don't we take him at his word and what he says in the Bible? Because that is much clearer. Uh, another argument is common grace. That uh, common grace means that we have to take the work of the, uh, the unbelievers. But certainly in the Bible, you find the unbelievers uh, make useful advancements. It was the offspring of Cain, yeah, remember, that uh, they invented tents, uh, music, uh, metal technology, and so on. But if you talk about common grace, we have to be careful, because the cans of Dort talk about that as well. They say, fallen man is left with some light of nature, whereby he retains the notion of God, but he's so far from arriving at the same knowledge of God through the light of nature that he does not even use it properly in natural or civil matters. Has a door to already caution us uh, to be careful about the works of other believers. Uh, you have to test the spirits. And so whatever this light may be, man only pollutes it in various ways and suppresses it by his wickedness. So in the conflict between mainstream science and Christianity, we have to be aware of the antithesis. Uh, the antithesis has to do with the struggle between believers and unbelievers that goes back all the way to Adam and Eve in paradise. Uh, C.S. Lewis, Lewis has written that there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. Adam Kuyper says much the same thing, that every square inch of creation is claimed by God. And what they're saying is that as Christians, we're involved in a warfare, it's more of ideas, which means you have to be perceptive, you have to test the spirits, you have to see what's 
presuppositions are being made, what the implications are. You have to know your Bible to see whether ideas are permissible or not. So Alan Kuyper said it's not faith against science, but we've got two scientific systems uh, opposed to each other, each having its own faith. So we've got the naturalists, the evolutionary worldview on the one side, and we've got the Christians uh, with their worldview, and they should both do their own science. So that's why Kuyper started the Freedom University, so that each discipline could be developed from a Christian perspective. So a Bible-based science, uh, we try to explain everything from a biblical background, a biblical framework, using the biblical notion of God, but also the historical events that are in the Bible, and they critique alternatives. Uh, some of the challenges there are explaining the dates of fossils, uh, explaining starlight and the big universe. There's different strategies that you can use. For example, if you look at uh, dates, there's lots of things that don't fit. I told you already about the lava flow in Hawaii that was dated at 22 million years old, so that's from the 1800s. Lately, they found a number of different dinosaur fossils that still have protein in it, and blood cells. Uh, those sorts of things uh, aren't supposed to last for more than a few hundred or thousand years, but these dinosaurs are supposed to be uh, 100 million years old or older. It doesn't fit in. And there are other things as well. Uh, you could try to explain things using particular theories, creationist theories, or you could argue that the entire creation was uh, created mature 6,000 uh, years ago. Or you could argue that uh, the theories are just useful fictions. That's, uh, you shouldn't do historical science at all. Gordon Clark, the reformed philosopher, took that line of approach. So there's different ways that you could use. Now, someone might ask you, if the Bible's true, uh, how do you explain fossils? How do you explain life from distant stars, uh, etc.? Now, I have a question like that. It's important uh, to show that it is possible to construct theories uh, consistent with the observations and the Bible uh, that allow you to fit that out together. But the trouble is you can come up with more than one theory. So again, you've got the problem that this theory is correct. We have to be very careful, however, that so the truth of the Bible is something uh, that we start with. Christian perspective is our fundamental starting point. Uh, we should never try to use scientific theory to prove that the Bible is true. Because if that theory should lose credibility, then the truth of the Bible is going to depend on it as well. But ultimately, the highest authority is, is God, so we should submit to God's word and not try to uh, uphold the truth of God's word through human explanations of it. So if science cannot easily explain biblical facts, uh, to me this just shows the limitations of human science, uh, particularly regarding origins. I'm almost finished here, a couple of minutes. So is the Islamic evolution credible? My first slide had Bruce Waltke in it, and he said, as Christians, we should believe in evolution because if we don't, the non-Christians will laugh at us and be ignorant, and we won't be able to present the gospel. But if you look at how atheists uh, view theistic evolutionists, they don't, they aren't impressed at all. The British Brockman has written about theistic evolution. Oh, but of course, the story of Adam and Eve was only symbolic, wasn't it? Symbolic. So in order to impress himself, he just had himself tortured, rescued. A very precarious punishment for symbolics and committed by a non-existent individual, as I say, barking mad. <laughs> Well, Dawkins has a firmer hold, I think, of Christian theology than a lot of theistic evolutionists do. So he's not convinced by it, because he can see that what they're doing is contrary to the Bible, which they claim to believe. And Al, Mo Al Mohler, a Reformed Baptist, said the body, says, the moment you say we have to abandon this theology in order to have the respect of the world, you end up with neither biblical orthodoxy nor the respect of the world. So finally, we wrap this up. As far as scientific evidence the Bible is concerned, we have to be very careful when we distinguish observation, the things that we actually observe, from speculation, 
which are theories that are invented in order to explain the data. So if, if you're involved with studying science, uh, you have to be very careful that you're aware of the naturalist's uh, presuppositions that are at play, what the implications are of accepting evolution, and uh, what the weaknesses are of the whole evolutionary framework. And we should be busy also uh, looking at alternative Bible-based science. In fact, every discipline uh, we as Christians should be busy with uh, deconstructing it from a Christian's point of view. Uh, secondly, I want to stress that we should be consistent. Okay, worldview comes as a package deal. So if you're a naturalist, you believe that the ultimate realities matter, and ultimately that leads you to conclude that mind is an illusion and the whole thing self-destructs. If you're a Christian, uh, then you should believe that God is the ultimate reality, that the Bible is God's truth, and that we explain everything through the eyes of uh, divine revelation. Once you try to mix the two, with naturalism and Christianity, that, that can theistic evolution, you'll find that if you introduce an inconsistency in your system, yeah, that will eventually deconstruct your whole system so that you end up being naturalist if you work consistently. But Mark 12 says uh, you should love the Lord your God with all your mind. Now Mark Noel is in the story, he's written a book called Scandal of the Exemplar Mind. I don't know if you may have heard of that book. And he says, well, the basic scandal of the evangelical mind is that it's not much of a mind at all. So he thinks that people don't think enough. And he's probably right. The trouble is that in his book, uh, one of the points of evidence he has for that is uh, precisely creation. He says a lot of people that still believe Genesis 1 through 11, they should be using their minds. And uh, so as far as I'm concerned, uh, the problem with the evangelical minds of Mark Knowles is that it's not very evangelical. Because once you start rejecting the first few chapters of the Bible, you end up with nothing at all. If you look at the Bible, you find that so there's a very interesting correspondence between the first three chapters of Genesis and the last three chapters of Revelation. If you look at those two, you'll find that there's a very close contrast between the two, and the rest of the Bible um, sort of footnotes on that. So once you do away with the, the bookend from the one end, so you're not going to end up with much. Thirdly, credibility. That's the argument that I hear most often, that we shouldn't believe, uh, we shouldn't believe in evolution, or we shouldn't believe in six-day creation, we shouldn't believe in Noah's flood, etc., because that will make us look foolish to the world and we won't be able to evangelize. But the, the trouble is that Christianity is foolishness to the world anyways. Um, the world doesn't want to believe in Jesus Christ coming back. They want, don't want to believe in God because that includes accountability for their actions. So if you're going to be considered a fool anyways, you may as well be a consistent fool and uh, hold on to what we have in the Bible. Because as you've seen here, uh, naturalism is incoherent. It gives you no hope at all. There's uh, no purpose in life, whereas Christianity gives us coherence. It gives us meaning, it gives us purpose. It gives you sound basis for science. But most of all, it gives you a purpose, right? We're here to uh, serve the Lord and to further the glory of His name. Thank you very much for your patience. Uh, I'd like to end here.